Um, so let's get started. Um, so the title is all about um, looking um, to try and move towards a test of quantum gravity, but um, I will talk actually about the other projects in my um, in my lab as well. So um, there's a big list because I'm talking about like all these three different projects, and there's, this is a huge list of um, people. So obviously there's Warwick people, and then all these people are working on the um, collaborators um, working together. We're working together on the thing about macroscopic superpositions towards testing uh, quantum gravity. And then these people are involved in the um, stuff about the quantum computing and the magnetometry. And this was 2019, 2020, and just um, a week or so back. So it's great to be um, back meeting up um, in person, of course. So, like I said, then there's three um, experiments that are going on in my lab, and I'll sort of go through them. I mentioned them all today. I'm not sure, like, how much weight to give to all different, um, give to the different ones. So I'll just sort of um, guess, but do uh, um, do shout out if you've got any questions. Do please interrupt, put your hand up. Um, so everything though is using similar experiments. So um, everything is using this nitrogen vacancy defect in diamond. And um, so this is obviously a Diamond lattice is all carbon, and then if you replace one of the carbon atoms with a nitrogen atom, um, then that's a good start. But then if you remove a carbon atom that's neighboring it, then you've got this nitrogen vacancy defect, which um, has this has these great properties that I'll start um, talking about in a minute. And it's sensitive to magnetic fields, so we can do the magnetometry. It has an electron spin, so we can use that for storing and processing quantum information for a quantum computer and um, um, we'll be using the spin uh, and the long coherence time and the fact that we can um, initialize the spin and we can read it out all, all these things we're sort of needing for this last thing number three which is um, about trying to create a macroscopic superposition of a diamond that's in a superposition of two different positions and the reason particularly that that's exciting to me is because it might let us um, do a test of whether gravity is something that has, you know, particular quantum properties. I'll, I'll sort of be more specific about what I mean by quantum gravity uh, later on when I'm doing that. Quinter, sometimes the clicker sometimes clicks and sometimes it doesn't. So this is a diamond that's about a millimeter across and this is the sort of size scale that we use for the magnetometry. And you see it's not see-through. It's got this, this, this lovely color. That's because it's jam-packed full of these nitrogen vacancy centers. And we're sending in the green laser light and detecting this red fluorescence that comes off. So this red fluorescence is always our signal. It lets us know what, what the spin's doing, as, as you'll see in a minute. And here's... Um, a magnetic resonance spectrum of this. So we're measuring, like I said, we measure this red light, that's our, our signal, um, basically on the y-axis, and then on the x-axis we're sweeping a micro frequency, and for some micro frequencies then we get a resonance, which is because we're flipping the electron spin, and that's changing the amount of, um, of red light that's coming out. It's called optically detected magnetic resonance. So all this stuff is, is central to you know all of all of these experiments. And so what's going on? We can understand from these energy levels. So um, it's an electron spin one. So it's got these three energy levels here in the ground state. And at room temperature, then um, it can be in any of these states because this energy gap is only about three gigahertz. But then we send in green light, which excites it up and goes from um, uh, the, the the spin zero um, to the spin zero. It loses some phonons at the top there, which isn't um, isn't too important. 
when it decays back, emitting this red fluorescence, it gives out one photon of, of red, which we detect. But then if we flip the spin state with some microwaves and go again, something different happens. There's these phonons, but then it's more likely to take this branch. It comes over into these dark states. It gets a bit stuck here for maybe 300 nanoseconds or so. Um, and then eventually it, it decays back. But if it comes this route, it doesn't give out any red light. And so um, that means that we detect less red light if we're in this spin state. And so that's very useful. That means that we can read out the spin state optically. So this means that we can read out the spin state of a single defect, a single nitrogen vacancy defect with this optical technique, whereas normally we might need 10 to the 10 spins just to get a signal with if we're doing an experiment like this, um, but without this optical readout. So that's really useful. And the other thing is that because of this, um, uh, the way these transitions go, then just by sending in green light, we preferentially pump it into the spin zero state, which is a great starting, space, st starting state. So without that, we might need to put the diamond into a magnetic field of 10 tesla and cool it down to 4 kelvin, which is perfectly possible, but it's just a bit of a pain. And um, um, yeah, a 10 tesla magnetic field in particular is a big superconducting magnet, and so it's not, not practical for lots of commercial applications. Um, and then the magnetometry, so I'm starting off talking about the magnetometry, and you can see um, from here why this thing is sensitive to magnetic fields. So this is just the Zeeman splitting here as we increase the magnetic field. Then these energy levels split, and so then um, in some magnetic field, we've got two different resonances here from zero to minus one, zero to plus one. And then if we measure this, uh, the spectrum of these uh, transitions, then we can back out what the magnetic field is. Um, that's a sort of a very um, um, basic explanation of the magnetometry. We end up doing a whole bunch of, um, of tricks, experimental tricks that I won't uh, particularly go into, but um, it, it comes back to this, this uh, method of, of seeing the magnetic field. Kevin? Yep. Yeah. Forgive my ignorance on this, but this technique also tells you the orientation of the field? It does, yeah, 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 yeah. So um, the NV center has four orientations in the diamond lattice. So there's one here, one here, one down here, and one back there. And so they all respond differently to the magnetic field, and we can get that. So we can have a vector magnetometer, um, which is, um, you know, again, uh, another extra little useful uh, application thing. Yeah. Um, this is some of the literature on using these nitrogen vacancy centers for magnetometry. This is only a tiny part of the literature. There's, it's a massive, um, massive popular effort. Um, this is some of the best work without using fiber coupling. But so we're doing ours fiber coupled. And the benefit of that is that um, we can have great sensitivity because we have a rack of equipment with nice um, um, nice electronics and nice laser and everything. And then we can fiber couple that to our um, to our sensor head. I've got a video in a minute, I'll show you. Um, and then the sensor head though is mobile and it can we can uh, move it around and put it where where we want it to be for measuring something. So you could put it on your your chest and try and measure the magnetic field from your heart, which is something that we're we're trying to do. Is this video I mentioned. Let's try and play it. So here's a rack of electronics. And this is the sensor head. So this is an optical fiber. And so we send in the green light here. We measure the red fluorescence coming back off. Um, we've got microwaves coming in here. And if, um, if I play it again, then you can see that what we do is wave um, a mobile phone near it and um, we see a signal due to that because there's little magnets in your phone and, um, and the whole design is such that we've got the diamond right up close to the edge so we can try and get the thing that you care about up close to the sensor and so we want to put this onto onto our chests in order to look for the signals from from our heart and um, um, other other things as well. I want to look at, at some uh, corrosion in steel as well. 
Um, so in this paper, then we sort of showed that we can get the noise down. And so, like I said, um, I'm not going to go into all the experimental tricks and the engineering tricks, but we got down, the, the latest that we've got down to is 100 picotesla per root hertz. Um, so when we published this, then that was the, this was the record for the most sensitive fiber coupled diamond magnetometer. Another group has since put something on the archive that's um, gone ahead of us, but obviously we're uh, we're uh, making improvements now as well, but um, this is so. This is the noise spectrum. So there's magnetic noise at different frequencies, and we're detecting that. But this, for example, this peak here is 50 hertz, and there's some harmonics of that. And so, this, and this is a real. This isn't 50 hertz noise in our system. This is actually detecting the 50 hertz magnetic field in in the room. Um, um, so that's that's a signal rather than uh, rather than noise, you could say. Um, how, how have you speaking the shot noise? Um, we haven't. Sorry. So this is the shot noise limit. Oh, up that. So here we we seem to have beaten it. That's um, not really uh, beating it at all. So this is because we're using a lock-in amplifier, and so we're only so, so um, we're only actually measuring magnetic fields at these lower frequencies. So up here, the lock so the lock-in amplifier is just rejecting all signals above a um, um, few hundred hertz. And so, um, yeah, I guess we should should sort of take out the dashed line here because, um, well, yeah, so this noise, we're just we're just killing, killing all the uh, all the signal down here with with the lock and amplifier. Um, yeah, so we're keen to sort of push this closer to the shot noise limit and to um, push down the shot noise limit as well by increasing the amount of, um, of light, by increasing the amount of red light that we're, we're collecting. Um, but yeah, we're, we're sort of confident we can improve this still by another. So we, we've, we've won uh, about six or seven orders of magnitude in this over the last sort of five or six years. Not, not over the best in the world, but over, over where we started. We've sort of, you know, um, made great progress over where we started. And we can certainly see sort of another two orders of magnitude improvement in this, which um, you know would uh, be great for for applications. But that really would be the shot noise. That would have to push the shot the, the shot noise limit down basically. So we can push that down by collecting more red light. Also, there's a trick where we can there's a trick called magnetic flux concentrators that's been demonstrated. So you get a cone of um, soft magnetic material like ferrite and the magnetic fields you're trying to sense get funneled in this ferrite and concentrated just to the point where, where the diamond is so then you can throw away some spatial resolution and um, improve your sensitivity like that just make your signal bigger but yeah there's, so there's loads you know there's sort of probably 10 or so like little experimental tricks that we've used to win a factor of two or five or, or, or ten and um, there's still more of those to sort of um, to implement. And this was just so rad is the first author here he is meeting uh, Donna Strickland. Um, and this is sort of a schematic of how it how it works this fiber coupling concept so inside this dashed line is the electronics so we send in the green light to the diamond, we measure the red light coming back, we send in the microwaves to the diamond, and one application is we'd like to measure uh, magnetocardiography, which is sort of known to be useful diagnostically, but hasn't been commercially successful because squid magnetometers are really um, big and expensive and impractical. Um, also measuring corrosion in steel is um, another application. We've sort of got some data on that here, which I'll sort of maybe um, skip over in the interest of time a bit. But so the clever idea here was to have a, um, a little magnet to introduce a tiny little magnet here, which is this tiny little magnet. And then the magnetic flux from that um, interacts with the steel. And then there's some there's some damage here in the steel and the magnetic flux, um, you know, is distorted by the steel and by the damage and then the diamond detects that and then having this small magnet gives us great spatial resolution which we don't have otherwise so we get down to sort of a millimeter um, or better spatial resolution like this 
Um, so we can image damage in the steel, and I'll sort of skip over this a bit. We've got a video of this. So this is speeded up times 20, but we're sort of scanning the steel here underneath this uh, this magnetometer and building up a, a 2D image of the, the defect. Defect in the steel. Um, So this is some of the advantages of using these um, diamond magnetometers. Um, the room temperature, the, the, the solid state, they don't need vacuum. And so they're, you know, they're quite robust because of that. Um, they can um, measure sensitively over a big range. So there's this high dynamic range. And we're particularly interested in these um, applications here. Like I said, non-destructive testing is looking for the corrosion in the steel. So that's um, the conclusion of the magnetometry bit. Um, so we sort of so this was the most sensitive fiber coupled diamond magnetometer, and we we can see some damage in in the steel. So let's get on to sort of the quantum computing bit. Um, here's uh, two of the um, Nobel laureates uh, from 2018 were. Um, pioneering sort of these high power lasers and ultra fast lasers and Patrick Salter, Martin Booth in Oxford, talking to Jason Smith in Oxford, um, managed to use one of these um, ultra fast lasers to put some damage into a diamond here. And then this is, and we call this, the, you know, they call this laser writing damage into the diamond. And that diamond, that damage is um, is vacancies, is is missing. Um, you know, some some of that damage is is vacancies, which is these missing carbons. And then we can anneal the diamond and um, make nitrogen vacancy centers where where we want them with this um, this laser writing. And so this was our first attempt from 2017, where these dots are these nitrogen vacancy centers, and um, this uh, this data is showing that. The optical line widths can be can be good um, at, um, at low temperatures, which is something that we need for the quantum computing. Is these um, small line widths we need in order to be able to entangle optically two NB centers. And then um, what we've done recently is measure the spin coherence, and it turns out to be as long or longer than um, any sort of naturally occurring nitrogen vacancy centers, which is great for, for quantum computing. This is um, a picture of a video of um, uh, where these dots are the different NB centers that um, that we've written in. Water room temperature. Yeah, yeah. We'll go on the desktop. What? We'll go on the desktop. Well, um, so not, not our quantum computers. So we're so we're actually starting a company. So Jason Smith and me are starting a company to build this nitrogen vacancy quantum computer, but we're going to do it at four Kelvin because um, to optically entangle the NV centers, then we need to cool them down to get rid of some of the phonons um, because the way that you do the optical entangling, then you um, get each NV center to emit a photon and then you put them together on a on a beam splitter and you measure the photon. And if you set it all up carefully, then you measure a photon, but you don't know which NV center it came from. And then if you do that right, then you entangle them because you know that that one of them has emitted a, a photon. But, you know, it's as if, I don't know, if you don't mind some hand waving, it's as if the universe sort of doesn't know which, which NV center emitted the photon. And, you know, and then you're in an entangled state of both of them having emitted the photon. But for this, then they both have to emit um, indistinguishable photons. And um, so going to low temperature, you know, makes that possible because otherwise um, there's too much um, coupling to the phonons. And the light is too coupled to the phonons. And um, yeah, so we're going for four Kelvin, which is still sort of hot compared to some quantum computers. So the um, superconducting Quantum computers use dilution fridges that are, um, you know, much colder, which is a more difficult technology. There are some people trying to do room temperature quantum computing with diamond, but that looks really sort of um, um, 
really difficult. Mm. Typically, what are the coherence times? Ah, funny you should ask. So, well, no, I mean, I've got I've got some coherence times in a couple of slides, but not, yeah. Oh, so so to answer your question now, so the um, um, electron spin coherence times can be about a second, and then we use the plan is to use nuclear spins to store the quantum information, and they can have coherence time of of a minute. You know, this is experimentally. What happens when you entangle them? Do they still have the same amount of coherence? Um, um, pretty much. It's sort of um, so when you optically entangle them, then um, when you turn the light off, then uh, yeah, I mean, uh, when you turn the light off, then it's it's all right. But the issue is that to do the optical entangling, then you send in light to excite the fluorescence, and then that light can cause some extra decoherence. Um, but still, I, I think like when these coherence times are like more than a second, more than ten seconds, then it starts. You just you, you don't worry about coherence times so much. I think like you know the bigger problems um, now for this system is scaling up to having many qubits, and I think you know the coherence times here are um, are going to be you know fine already. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Obviously, like so, people have only looked at quite small entangled systems like you know seven qubits is, is pretty much the most and then you know how that how the coherence scales as you get to bigger entangled states you know we people haven't haven't looked at but yeah thank you yeah um this is a measurement um which shows that we're um looking at single nv centers as an autocorrelation function Showing that um, so time zero is is saying here that is this is this um, system emitting um, two photons with with a time of zero in between them and so and it's it's not because because it's dipping down below a half then the system's not able to this measurement's showing that the system's not able to emit two photons at once and so this is how we check that we've just got a single NV center and uh, which is what we want and so here's some statistics showing that you know we can um, um, have sort of um, up to sort of 10 percent um, you know five, five to ten percent yield of, of, of single NV centers where we want them and we've looked at lots of um, looked at some statistics on that and yeah so the, 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 the spin coherence we measure with a spin echo, so um, we, this is a block sphere, and we use a 90 degree pulse to create a spin superposition, and then this refocusing pulse um, gets rid of some of the, the, the decoherence. Um, so they spread out, which looks like decoherence, but then this refocusing pulse can get rid of that. Um, and then to measure the spin coherence time, we vary this time between the two pulses and we see how much of the echo is left as a function of time and so in this way we can measure the, um, the spin coherence and so here we've got about um, 700 microseconds spin coherence at room temperature but so then um, um, when you cool it down then um, it, it can get much longer um, but we haven't haven't got data on that for ours yet. But so here's these two NV centers that both, but so yeah, this, this number of about 700 microseconds is is um, as long as, as any sort of NV center at room temperature under the same conditions. And so that's um, showing that we've, we've got great, great qubits here. And we've again done some statistics, looked at um, 20 or more uh, NV centers like this that we've made. And these are wires, and so this is um, another thing that we can do with the laser writing. So instead of just putting in an NV center here, um, Patrick Sauter in, in Oxford can put in this graphitic damage, which is conducting. And so this is um, a way of putting in wires, which is going to be great for um, applying electric fields and applying microwaves maybe and applying uh, RF so we can uh, put, you know we can have control of these these uh, defects and this is sort of um, a schematic of, of where we're where we're going with this wanting to have many of these NV centers on one diamond and 
entangling them as, as you might um, you might guess. What's been done so far is to have sort of single NV centers in different cryostats and to optically entangle them, which is fine, uh, which is, is very impressive. But, you know, for a quantum computer, we're going to want to have, um, you know, 100,000 of these qubits on one diamond and, um, you know, have, uh, uh, um, and that's needed for the error correction in order to be able to try and um, do a useful quantum computation. Okay, that was the end of the um, quantum computing bit. Looks like I've got half an hour for talking about um, levitating nanodiamonds. Um, so this is a whiteboard, and um, um, you will know that we can have this superposition in quantum mechanics. We can have an atom that's going through the left slit and the right slit. If it's a, a two-slit experiment, you can have this superposition, and that's just totally... Um, backed up by existing experiments um, for a long time. Um, and then Schrodinger in 1935 was saying, oh, isn't it weird that cats don't do that, which is um, um, a fair point. And so this is um, a, a Schrodinger cat state of a cat being in two different places, um, a superposition of the cat being in two different places. And so we're not doing any, um, any biology, but we're interested in, in this, this gap in between so we want to um, create a, a macroscopic uh, superposition state. We want to have a nanodiamond in a superposition of being in two different places. And, you know, the cat's enormous, but a nanodiamond that's, you know, one or two microns across would be plenty big enough to really sort of um, challenge our existing ideas about, um, you know, quantum mechanics and um, about uh, quantum gravity. And so... Um, I think I've got a slide about this, so, um, I mean, even sort of once Einstein was coming up with general relativity, then he was starting to see that things were not that simple in terms of trying to combine it with quantum mechanics, um, but um, Bronstein was working on that back in um, um, the 30s. Feynman then, um, in this uh, conference in 1957, he sort of showed up and talked about it, gave, gave his thoughts, and, you know, and they were very, uh, very important in, uh, in, in, in thinking about quantum gravity. We didn't write a paper about it, but somebody was sort of making notes of what he said, and they published it, and it, you know, it's become a very important um, uh, piece of the literature. Um, but so he was, some of the things that he was saying was, were that if, um, um, you know, basically everybody thinks that you're going to need to quantize gravity. It's very, very, uh, you know, you can come up with um, a situation in which gravity doesn't get quantized, but then, you know, what you're going to have, what, what, what you're going to need for that really is that if, if, if that's the case, then you can't, you can't create macroscopic superpositions. And so here's a macroscopic superposition. This is a Stern-Gerlach um, cartoon. So with the nanodiamond starting at the top and it, um, it has a spin, and so if we put the spin, obviously the spin is a single nitrogen vacancy center in this cartoon, and then if we put that spin into a superposition of, of um, two different spin states, and then if we have an inhomogeneous magnetic field, then there's a Stern-Gerlach thing where we have a superposition of the diamond being in two places, and then if we can um, um, reverse that trajectory and bring the two superposition components back, then we would be doing some matter wave interferometry. Um, and so this sort of stuff is done, um, obviously, with atoms, with, with BECs, um, but doing it with sort of a nanodiamond with 10 billion atoms um, is, um, it's, you know, is, is sort of beyond the current state of the art. But then, so Feynman was sort of saying, you know, what is the gravitational effect coming from this sort of thing? You know, if we have quantum mechanics, and if you're happy that this diamond is in a superposition of two different places, then you're allowed to ask what's the gravitational field or the, the curvature of space-time that's, that's coming from this, and you pretty much sort of end up having to say that, you know, that curvature of space-time or whatever gravity is, it's, it, it's in a superposition as well, unless you just say, you know, that somehow these things are not, are not allowed beyond sort of some size scale, which is 
it's um you know which is not not stupid but it's um it's, it's not not as popular in the, in the community but so Feynman I mean sorry not Feynman uh, Penrose so Roger Penrose is keen on the idea that once um something is you know something massive that's too massive is in a spatial superposition then there's some objective collapse that just sort of um, collapses the wave function and, and doesn't allow such a large spatial superposition. Um, but so Feynman was saying, you know, let's try and do an experiment like this, which was uh, um, utterly uh, impractical to try and sort of measure the, the gravitational field in, in this way. Yeah. So both the number of atoms and the distance as well? Exactly, and the time. So what we're looking for is is a very macroscopic um, um, superposition, and there's um, you know a lot of work on defining what counts as, as macroscopicity here. Um, and the answer, and then there's no one de no one answer, but the answer is that it sort of depends on exactly what you want to what you're interested in. But certainly, for it to be um, you know large macroscopicity, then it should be large mass. Large superposition distance is this distance, and for a long time, and you can, you know, see that that's um, um, what you expect, perhaps. Um, and so, yeah, so there's this question dating back to, um, you know, many, many decades, um, which seems like a well posed question. You know, if, if quantum mechanics seems to allow. Um, these uh, superpositions of massive objects, then what's the gravitational effect of, of that, that, that system? And the exciting progress on that comes from um, a collaborator of mine called Sagato Bose at UCL. So he suggested that let's have two Schrodinger cats and look at the gravitational interaction between them. And um, that ends up winning in terms of making it a practical experiment. I mean, it's still so it's still an incredibly difficult experiment, but it's not it's not crazy anymore because these things are incredibly sensitive. So they're, they're um, you know the the phase of this superposition is incredibly sensitive to stuff happening around it, and obviously gravity is outrageously weak. So we've got you know. We can feel the gravity thanks to the fact that there's a planet underneath us, but you know, um, the gravity between stuff that's not that's not planets is really <laughs> is really feeble. And so, but the numbers sort of work out. Well, they do work out if you've got a, a two micron diamond, and if the superposition distance is about um, 250 microns, and then you've got two of them, and you hold the superposition for a second or so. Then it should be um, possible to um, to see the, um, the the gravitational effect between these two, and specifically the effect that we uh, that seems the best to look for is to look for seeing if, if gravity can entangle these two um, these two interferometers. And if um, and it's a thing that's understood in the quantum information literature that. If something can entangle two things, then that thing must be quantum. Um, so you can't sort of um, use a classical messenger to to entangle things, um, which is sort of um, explained more in this paper. But it's sort of it's sort of been accepted for a long time in the in the field of, of quantum information. And so this is saying so this test. So the idea is do this experiment, see if these two Diamonds are entangled at the bottom, and if they are, then gravity must permit, you know, the gravitational effects must be able to be in a superposition, which would be, um, you know, um, a really useful experimental window into quantum gravity. It wouldn't immediately start telling you which version of string theory or or, group, or, or loop quantum gravity or whatever is is the right version, but you know, it might be um, a window that then you could uh, exploit to. To get more information about you're quantum gravity. Well, not really. No. So, so the 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 scheme isn't is 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 sort of agnostic about whether there are gravitons or not. I mean, if there were, if there are gravitons, then this would be sort of a virtual graviton because this these masses are so small. But the whole scheme doesn't. Um, you know, so I've drawn in this wiggly arrow, which looks for all the world like a graviton, but the whole scheme is just um, agnostic to what what gravity is. Or um, yeah, 
except you have to rule out all of the possible coupling mechanisms. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why that's why the experiment gets hard. So um, one of the um, so yeah, we have you have to you have to do the experiment in a regime where the gravity is stronger than other other coupling mechanisms, and so. Um, one of the reasons that the experiment gets hard is that then we need like this closest approach here to be about 200 microns. We'd like to make it smaller so that gravity, so the gravitational interaction was stronger, but we can't because there's a Casimir force. And so the the limiting thing ends up being a Casimir interaction between these two. And so, we, but, but yeah, if, if we have this distance sort of 200 microns or more, then the gravity sort of ends up taking over from the other interactions. Um, so this is like an enormously difficult experiment, you know, might be on the scale of LIGO in, um, in difficulty. It might take, you know, a long time for a lot of people, but it doesn't require, I don't think, it doesn't look like it requires any civil engineering. It looks like a, a, it looks like it could be done on a tabletop, but it's, um, but there's lots of challenges. Just, these numbers sort of mean that, um, you know, there's lots of progress needed. Analog of that. Yeah, yeah. So it would be what great. Is it? I mean, it must be. Well, it would be to have a charge on both of these, for example. Yeah. So if you could look for entanglement due to um, the electromagnetic interaction, and that would be a good thing to do first, because that would be a stronger effect. Much stronger effect. Yeah, yeah. So, but so to do this with gravity, then these would have to be neutral, obviously, electrically neutral. Which, so that's you know not not difficult to set up in itself. But yeah, doing it with um, electromagnetism would be a good um, stepping stone. But the whole experiment is sort of, you know, even just doing it with one of these. So what, what Ben and James and me are working on and, uh, in the lab at the moment is trying to do one of these matter wave interferometry experiments, not two, and do it with a spatial superposition distance here that is incredibly tiny. So the diamonds are maybe a micron across, and we'd like to have spatial superposition distance of about 0.1 picometers. So much, much, much smaller than the diamond. But yeah, so for this case, then you'd have to sort of make the superposition distance greatly bigger. But so, but the numbers make sense when we sort of write down estimates with, with real numbers, and it looks like we can, we can get to this, but it's just an enormous um, engineering uh, challenge. Um, so this is the most macroscopic spatial superposition experiment so far. This is um, big molecules with about 2,000 2, atoms in them going through a grating experiment um, and just doing interference, obeying normal quantum mechanics as, as uh, you know, as we expect. Uh, grating. You've got to use grating. No gratings. So gratings don't sort of really work once you get to larger masses because the de Broglie wavelength obviously gets smaller and smaller as your mass gets bigger, and then you know you're not going to fit through your grating when your uh, when your de Broglie uh, um, wavelength gets so tiny, you're not going to see the wave-like effects. But so yeah, so we have a Stern-Gerlach um, um, concept instead where you know we have the spin in a spin superposition and an in inhomogeneous magnetic field to pull pull apart the, the you know the um, the two components um, but yeah but theirs is amazing because they've done it and our, we haven't done ours and so we have to uh, um, give them credit for that this is this is a bit of a hero experiment as well but um yeah but two two thousand atoms is still more like you know more like the regime you expect maybe quantum mechanics to work. Um, so yeah, we have a whole bunch of theory proposals talking about how to do this, um, and um, also um, paper from another group. So we sort of started off here. This one um, gives us a much bigger superposition distance. Well, sorry, no, this one, the, the, this uh, PRL from twenty sixteen. This 2017 paper is, is the one with the two Schrodinger cats for gravity. Um, this one I'll talk about in a minute from 2020. And um, this is um, a new one uh, with Ben as the, uh, the first author. Um, but so just to go back to your question about spin coherence. So 
um, this is showing the longest, the absolute longest spin coherence, not, not the absolute longest, but almost the longest spin coherence times for NV centers um, for their electron spins. And um, here it's getting up to half a second, but that's making use of the fact that there's loads of pi pulses being sent in to flip the spins. So this is called dynamic decoupling. Um, and um, that sort of really helps get rid of a load of, you know, winds orders of magnitude and getting rid of some of the, the noise, some of the decoherence. And so we're going to need this. So for these proposals, we're going to want these very long coherence times. The whole system has to stay coherent, obviously, throughout. And um, so that means we're going to need to uh, make use of this this dynamic decoupling with lots of lots of pulses. Um, and so that was something that was um, that we were introducing in this paper. This is Martin Plenio um, is a um, great collaborator in Ulm and, and Newland uh, Pedernales in, in Ulm. And the idea is to do motional dynamic decoupling. So um, dynamic decoupling is just like the spin echo. So I showed you the video of the of the spin echo where you sort of have the, the dephasing that comes out and then you do a pi pulse to sort of um, uh, uh, bring bring the, the different red arrows back together, bring bring the spins back together. Um, and so that's just all in the block sphere with the spins. But in this paper, then we're proposing doing something like that, but with with the motion, with, with the motion of the diamond. So the diamond actually, um, so we have um, a superposition of, of the green and the, sorry, the, uh, the blue and the red. So the diamond is in a superposition of going left and right, but then we're going to flip the spins so that then they reverse and then flip it, flip it again and they reverse again. And so we keep on like a child on a swing, we're pushing it resonantly because it's, because the system has has this, the motion naturally has this resonant behavior because it's diamagnetic diamond in a in an inhomogeneous magnetic field. Then it has this this natural frequency, and so the the proposal here is to to keep on on pushing it at its natural frequency so that it um, does this motion on dynamic decoupling, which would be great for getting rid of a load of the decoherence because the because the um, the motion is sampling the left and the right, then you cancel out a load of the decoherence that um, that is uh, is present. Um, and in this paper, then we looked at lots of um, um, decoherence sources like um, electric charges and gas atoms and um, the Casimir and vibrations and black body radiation. So there's, there's a huge number of um, you know boring things going on in this in this experiment that we need to close down in order to to actually be able to look at um, gravity. Um, and so here's Ben. So he's um, been working on um, an improved proposal here. And so by putting in these magnetic teeth, so the idea in this schematic is start with a diamond at the top, drop it so it falls through this sort of two meter drop. Um, and then when it, so it falls down here, it builds up some speed as it's falling. And then here we're going to create this spin superposition that I've been talking about. And then down here, it's it's going into um, a spatial superposition. Um, but we need these, we think we need these magnetic teeth in order to be able to have enough um, dynamic decoupling, in order to have enough of these these pi pulses to uh, to give us a long spin coherence. So if I skip back, remember I was saying we need um, not, you know, we need um, maybe 5,000, 10,000 pi pulses to go in. And each time we send in the pi pulse, then we flip the spin. And we need to make sure that the, that, that the diamonds are still um, moving apart, which they won't do. If we keep on uh, if we keep on flipping the spin, then we'll average that out. So to make, um, you know, so, so that the diamonds do keep on moving apart, then we need to keep changing the, the direction of the magnetic field in homogeneity, which is what comes from these teeth. So here's a, um, a model, a COMSOL finite element model of the magnetic field from these offset teeth. And the blue is what we want, the blue is what we like. This is showing that the inhomogeneous magnetic field is changing direction with each uh, tooth. And then that means that we can flip the spin but still have the superposition distance uh, grow instead of 
disappearing. And then because we can control the shape of the teeth, the, you know, the spacing means that we can um, control how many pi pulses that we're sending in. So then we can uh, have enough to maintain the spin coherence. Um, and then this is showing that we would still do some of the motion or dynamic decoupling as well from the Martin Plenio paper, um, tiny bit, just, you know, but having two of these lobes means that we can get rid of a load of the, um, the decoherence, particularly thing, you know, one, one particular thing is the tilt. So the whole experiment is outrageously sensitive to, to tilt, but with this motion of dynamic decoupling, you can basically get rid of that. So it's not sensitive to tilt, which, um, which we need. Um, I'm going to sort of skip through now some, um, um, I haven't got much time left, but I'll show you a little bit of um, our preliminary data on levitating these, these nanodiamonds. So this is uh, Angelo um, um, in the lab with this uh, vacuum chamber where we're, um, you know, levitating these, these nanodiamonds. Um, if you look inside, then this was our old design. So this is using um, a microscope objective and focusing um, a laser beam down to a point. So this is called optical trapping, optical tweezers. And this is what we were doing. Ben and James um, are now setting up a magnetic trap um, instead of this, this optical trapping. Um, and you'll see in a moment uh, the reason that we've gone away from this, this optical trapping. But we do get nice photos. So this is this objective and here, the green dot is um, is a nanodiamond that's levitated there in, in vacuum. Um, but the problem is that these nanodiamonds overheat. And so this is showing that as the optical trapping power goes up, then the internal temperature of the diamonds is, is going up. And we didn't really measure beyond here because this is about the temperature where nanodiamonds uh, burn or graphitize and um, it's difficult to carry on once your diamond is... Uh, been destroyed, and it's difficult to test quantum gravity once you've destroyed your uh, your probe. Um, but so this was sort of um, um, what was pushing us away from the optical trapping. Obviously, in vacuum, then there's no way for the diamonds to dissipate heat, and they're quite transparent. Um, but a little bit of heat they pick up, and then they can't can't get rid of it. Um, this did push us towards. Um, a good direction though. So the um, commercially available nanodiamonds that we were using have a load of impurities in them and they're sort of, um, you know, the diamond starts out being yellow before they turn it into nanodiamonds. Um, and that's not good. So we um, have made some nanodiamonds with much purer, a thousand times purer starting material. And so Ollie Williams group turned a load of this into, uh, into nanodiamonds for us and we, we used that we use that from now on. Um, and we did show that we could do the optical trapping with these more pure nanodiamonds and they would stay at, at room temperature, which was, um, you know, it was encouraging at the time and that was positive at the time. But we're sort of looking ahead to want, you know, the quantum gravity experiment is going to need these nanodiamonds to be at, at 5 Kelvin or, or, or a bit lower because of black body radiation, um, you know, if, if the diamond's emitting black body radiation, then you might use that to measure its position. And, you know, you mustn't, you're not allowed to measure its position, obviously, if you're trying to keep it in a spatial superposition. Um, also, this, this was at room temperature, but only when we were at four millibar, and we need to get down to more like, you know, 10 to the minus, depends on the specific experiment, but 10 to the minus 12 millibar, 10 to the minus 15 millibar, depending on how ambitious you're trying to be with, the, with your, your outcomes. And so, you know, the more pure nanodiamonds are brilliant, but we, um, um, you know, they're, they're not going to let us get down to the, these cryogenic temperatures and, and these ultra high vacuum levels, which is why we moved over, we're moving over to this, uh, this magnetic trap. But another advantage of the more pure nanodiamonds is that they have longer spin coherence. Um, and so Guy put some of these nanodiamonds into scanning electron microscopy and we can get nice um, pictures of, of the diamond. And then um, he'd set it up cleverly so that he could then take the sample out and put it into our um, confocal microscope and see 
where there were NV centers. And so now the, the color is, is, is the, the fluorescence light coming from the NV centers. And so then we can do our spin control experiments and compare them with the, uh, the scanning electron microscopy to know what, what the diamond looks like. And then that lets us measure um, long spin coherence times from, from the nan nanodiamonds. So, you know, not, so, so the, 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 these, these coherence times are not as long as um, bulk, as bulk diamond we get in bulk diamond. The nanodiamond has got surfaces, it's got extra uh, spin defects on the surface and things like that. But we're sort of pushing, um, pushing closer towards um, having spin coherence times that are, are similar to, to bulk diamond. Um, this is a diamagnetic trap. Um, from the literature, this is, so we're copying, we're sort of modifying this design. Um, we're going to have a diamond uh, di uh, di diamagnetically trapped here, levitating in the middle. And that's um, almost the end. So this is a conclusion part for the levitated nanodiamond stuff. So we um, have got a whole bunch of theory proposals showing uh, why it's interesting to look at these um, macroscopic uh, spatial superpositions and how we could do it with diamond and these pure diamonds um, are good for being more transparent and being um, ha having longer spin coherence and then there's a final conclusion slide for the three um, the three topics and um, that's all from me so thank you for listening Uh, and uh, are there any questions? More questions? Maybe some of them for the national. Well, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm going to yeah, microphone. You mentioned needing to um, get rid of all these possible ways to talk. I could just repeat it if you like. Have you got a whole, um, isn't there a kind of whole multifold expansion there? It would be almost impossible to cancel that. You have very little control over anything apart from the shell. Yeah, yeah. So there will always be um, electric, uh, there'll be permanent electric dipoles in the diamond. Um, so yeah, we don't necessarily need to worry about uh, higher, higher um, dipoles, but yeah, the permanent electric dipoles are going to be um, a source of interaction, but we think that that's going to be less than gravity for this. Um... Is that part of why you need to get them a certain distance apart? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I have a question. Uh, you said the coherence times is about uh, even half a second, almost half a second. How long does it take to say typically gain uh, Make a typical gate in a yeah. Like this. yeah, yeah. So it takes us, um, say, you know, in, in 10 nanoseconds, 20 nanoseconds, then we can do a, um, a, a spin flip. We can, you know, do a, the, the most simple type of, of quantum gate where we're flipping just the electron spin. Um, so there's a big, um, yeah, lots of um, manipulations we can do in that time. Um, but then there's other types of um, gates that are much slower, and so <clears throat> you know, doing a, um, a quantum gate on the um, the nuclear spins takes you know maybe like a thousand times longer, you know, on the order of um, 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 ten microseconds. But then the coherence times are longer as well on the nuclear spins, you know, more like a minute. So I think there's still a good a good ratio there. But for the quantum computing, then the difficult um, the most difficult gate is the um, entangling two electron spins optically, and that's been done um, in Delft by Ronald Hansen's group. Um, and they've even entangled three NB centers um, optically as well. But at the moment, then that's um, that's slower, and the fidelity is not so good, and so um, that's you know um, needs the, the the speed and the fidelity need to be improved for the quantum computing. And so our plan for that is to have an optical resonator, an optical cavity, um, which would give us a per cell effect enhancement of the um, the photon emission from the NV center and would be able to sort of really improve that optical entangling. Um, 
So another question about the quantum computing part. Um, so do you think that um, in the future, it's about the scaling issue. So do you think it will be more like a quantum computer inside one single diamond or many diamonds with a few quantum computers inside the packing? So because you mentioned that the packing is different when you do it inside uh, between diamonds. Yeah. Um, so, and also, I also, sometimes when I hear about quantum computers from, from Google people, for example, they discuss the issue of cabling. And this is like the what prevents them from going to hundreds of thousands of qubits. And this is also a factor there. So. Yeah, yeah, no, so those are important questions. So, um, I think we could go a really long way in one diamond. I think we could have, so that we need maybe 10 microns square for each NV center. And then, you know, we could have certainly 100,000 NV centers on one diamond, which would be, you know, obviously very impressive. But you would still then after that, then you would be saying, oh, can we have some more uh, more qubits? And so then you would probably end up having a few diamonds, each one with, with um, a lot of NV centers in. And yeah, so the whole cabling thing is, um, um, you know, is, is an engineering issue for us as well. Got a sort of, you know, each, each NV center needs to have control lines. And, um, uh, you know, when you've got many, many, then yeah, when you've got many and you've got an optical readout for each one. And so when you've got many, then it, it becomes an engineering problem. And, but, you know, so there's, there's ideas about, about how to do that, you know, so we would not have sort of you know, one, we wouldn't have, you know, one wire for each NV, we'd have a lot less. So, you know, one, one, so, you know, we're not going to send in 100,000 wires into the cryostat. So we're going to have, you know, long term, we would have some classical computing, some classical silicon computing power down at the low temperatures. So we would send um, information first to that, and then that would send the control to the different NV centers. And then also, even still, we wouldn't have one wire per NV center because we can, you know, use tricks like where we sort of, you know, we can win, uh, uh, we can square root that by sort of having a grid of um, um, of wires where it's only the intersection of two wires that, that um, causes a, a, a control event. But yeah, this is, you know, big, um, big tasks for the future. Is there any online question? Um, no, nobody online. No. Thank you. Thank you again.